We live, we love, we serve. We live, we love, we serve. Listen, we all are privy to mistakes. I've been worshiping the Lord in this place. I don't remember everything. I was supposed to say, y'all have some grace with me this morning. It's a lot of words, okay? It's a lot of words. We live, we love, we serve. And don't y'all tell Pastor Mike, all right? All right. <laughs> I love you too. The scripture that we will be coming from today is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm reading from the NRSV version. We are going to be reading verses 7 through 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses seven through nine. But we have treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed let's go to God in prayer Lord let the words out of my mouth be pleasing to your sight for each and every individual who walked into this place looking for something give them this day their daily bread let them not look at the messenger but he or she or they who have ears let them hear what thus says the Lord we are open vessels today God do your work in us and through us. We love you, and it is in your name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. If you know anything about Paul, we know that he is the founder of this thing we call Christianity. And there have been a lot of things <laughs> that have said about Paul and a lot of our understanding of even what church is doesn't always actually come from Jesus. It comes from the letters that Paul wrote. And oftentimes I think we look and read those letters and we get context for what those particular churches were experiencing. Because if we remember, Paul never wrote letters anticipating that they were gonna be canonized into a thing called a Bible. Paul wasn't really even talking to any of us. Paul was establishing churches. Those churches were having circumstances. They were writing to Paul, and Paul was writing back to those individual churches about what they should do in their churches. And sometimes we have taken all of that because it's in this thing called the Bible and we have made it, made it meaning for how we should do church. And that has caused a lot of confusing because one time Paul says turn to your left and then the next time he turns to your right and you're like, what are we supposed to be doing? And often we're looking at those letters for understanding of how we should live our lives. But I think that Paul's words actually reveal a lot about who he is as a person. Because the reality is that when you lead, you're never outside of your experience. You do not lead in a vacuum, meaning that whatever you are going through transfers to the people that you are leading. And so we can gain a lot of understanding about what Paul is going through by simply reading his letters. And if you read 2 Corinthians in full, it is a little bit disjointed for a few reasons. The first being that they believe that it's just a mixture of a bunch of letters. It's not one full letter. So it's a little confusing. But also, one minute, 
Paul is happy and saying blessings and thanksgivings. The next minute he's coming after the church of Corinth. The next minute he's feeling a little anxious. The next minute he's going through recon trying to reconcile with them. Paul is going through some highs and lows of that letter because Paul was going through some things. And I believe that by the time Paul wrote these letters, he was in distress. Again, I said he was traveling around. He had spent maybe the last decade establishing these churches. And he wasn't staying there. He established a church here. He'd go about his business and he established a church here. And while he's over here, the folks at this church are writing him letters and asking him for advice. And he's giving them advice and then they ain't listening. You ever, anyone ever come to you and ask you for advice? Like you did not, it's not unsolicited advice. They have come to you because they believe that you might be a subject matter expert on something. They have come and asked you, and then they go and do something else. And I mean, it's their lives, right? So it's, it's fine, you can do what you want, right? But then you keep coming back. Why you keep coming and asking me if you're not going to do what I told you to do? It's like some of us be coming to these wailing steps every Sunday. Oh, Lord, give me a sign. Tell me something. God's telling you something. You go back and do whatever you want to do. Then you back at the well and steps the next Sunday. And God's like, you know what? I'm, I'm not fooling with y'all no more. I told you what to do. So Paul is probably a bit frustrated because he's trying to get this thing together. Remember, Christianity is this very new thing. There are these very new people, and he is traveling. And it is, it's not like he's flying on planes. This man is walking. I don't know if he's on a camel. However he's getting to where he's going, he is tired. And when you read chapter 1, verse 8, Paul says, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Paul didn't even want to live anymore. He despaired the notion of life because of what happened in Asia. And you're probably like, well, what happened in Asia? If you go back and you read Acts 21, you find that Paul had gone to Asia and he was telling James and his brothers about all the, the goodness that he was doing, all of the Gentiles that he was bringing into the fold, all the people who were learning about God, and he was excited. And they're like, we are excited for you, Paul. But you were in Jerusalem. And we believe that the folks are going to hear that you're in Jerusalem. And we have a problem because the Jews here believe that you are teaching something other than their understanding of the law. So here's how we're going to fix this. There are these four men who need to go through this purifi purification ritual. They can't afford to pay for it. You pay for their purif purification ritual in the temple, and then they will see that you're not going against the law of Moses. Paul's like, bet, I'm going to do it. They go to the temple. He does the ritual. They think it's all good. A few days later, some of the Jews who saw Paul in the temple are like, that's that man who's speaking other than the things that we know to be the law, who is going against our people. And it says that they riled up the entire city of Jerusalem. They drag Paul out of the temple and commence to beating him to death. And they are beating him so bad within inches of his life that the Roman soldiers have to come in and carry Paul out. But then the Roman soldiers assume that Paul must have did something to be getting this beat down, and so they arrest Paul. And Paul is essentially on house arrest for two years trying to prove that he didn't do the thing that they said he was doing, which was desecrating the temple, for two years. Then they had to move the man to Rome because there was a plot on his life. Two years. You ever been just doing the things you feel like God has called you to do and life just starts happening and you get hit and you continue to get hit and you continue to get hit? And you're like, what is this? And I feel like there's a particular extra layer of pain when the work that you do is God work. When you are like, you're my, like God is literally my boss. And we're doing these things to expand the kingdom. I know there have been plenty of times I have preached a sermon here and gone on the side and cried my eyes out. There have been plenty of conversations that I know, and not only me, 
who have been like, for real, this, this, is, this is what we get for doing your work? Like, I could have been a welder for this. Like, wh what is this? Like, this is, this is my reward for serving you. Because the reality is when we go through things, life doesn't stop. Right? Sometimes we like to be like, pause, put me in a cry cryogenic, you know, holder, pause, let me get off the ride. Can we let a few months pass? Can we let a few years pass? Let some time pass by, we but we don't get to stop. We get sick and we still got to figure out a way to feed our kids. We lose this job and we still got to figure out a way to pay our bills. We got to still keep showing up while life is happening and we just don't know what to do. And so I believe Paul is in distress. He is in jail. He is experiencing these things, and he's still trying to encourage these communities. But I also believe that Paul was probably trying to encourage himself. How do I keep going? What am I supposed to say? To, I, I don't have nothing to say to these people. What do you want me to do? And he picks up that pen and he writes, but we have a treasure in clay jars. To understand the significance of clay jars, you'd have to understand how they were made. You see, a potter takes and shapes a piece of clay to its desired shape. And then the potter puts that piece of clay into the fire at high, 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 uncontrollable heats. And depending on the atmosphere and the circumstances and the situations of where that heat is provided, it shapes that clay into something else. And the results are a permanent change. And when the clay comes out, it is stronger, but it's also weaker. Meaning it's strong because now it is this solid structure, but now it's weaker because it can break. The bonds are so porous that if you drop that thing, it dings, it breaks, where if you drop a piece of clay, you just pick it right back up again and you can reshape it. But once it has become a jar, it is fixed. There's a scripture in Jeremiah 18 where it says that God is the potter and we are the clay. And so if we can imagine that we are, that's what Paul's talking about, we are the clay jars, that God molds us to this desired shape, and God says it is good. But then God has to put it in the fire, and the fire is life. It is just life. And the heat happens, and it gets turned up at high temperatures, and things happen that we didn't anticipate, and things don't go the way we thought. We thought it was supposed to go left, and it goes right, and all these things happen. We get broken. People pick us up. They drop us. They dent us. We get bruised. All of these things happen. And it ain't God. It ain't the devil. Sometimes it is just life <laughs> happening because we are clay jars and it shatters, and it breaks. But, 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 from the time I was a little girl, I have loved words. My mama can tell you, she here. I used to carry around one of them black and white composition books, and, I, it, and it was my own dictionary. Any word that I found that I did not know the meaning of, I would write the, 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 the word in the, in the, 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 the meaning so that I could commit it to memory. I loved words so much that reading was my punishment when I got in trouble. I know it sounds crazy, but you gotta know your kids, right? When you have kids, you gotta know what works. Right? My little sister, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't want to get whooped. She was getting a whooping, she was trying to jump in the laundry like Saul was trying to hide in the baggage. But me, I was a stubborn kid, right, mom? You was not gonna get no pleasure out of whooping me. I was not going to cry. I was gonna sit there and know you feel this pain. So you, you couldn't really whoop me. My brother, he was like, could you just please whoop me so I could go back outside and play? Because my brother wanted to play outside. But me, I was like, people, meh, 
<laughs> you know, take them or leave them. So I didn't really care if you told me I couldn't go outside because I'm like highly introverted. So I was like, I'm good. So you couldn't whoop me. You couldn't tell me I couldn't go outside and play with people. All my mom could do was be like, you can't read. And I'd be like, oh, God. <laughs> right? The few times I got in trouble, I just, I just couldn't read. I loved words. I still love words. I love the big SAT words. But I also love the small little words. The words that you almost pass by in a sentence. The ones that if you put them there, completely change what you're meaning to convey. And of my favorite little words, my favorites are conjunctions. I first learned about conjunctions on Schoolhouse Rock episode, season two, episode three. I don't even know how I watched Schoolhouse Rock because that aired in the 70s and I wasn't even born yet, but I saw the Schoolhouse Rock and there was this song, if you know it, Conjunction Junction, what's your function? Hooking up, yeah, y'all know it. Hooking up phrases and words and clauses. Conjunctions hooked up things together. And I learned in school what the conjunctions were by an acronym, fanboys. For, and, nor, but, or, yet, so. For, and, nor, but. And in the song, it says, but, that's sort of an opposite. Not this, but that. It could be this, but instead, it's that. It could be this, but instead, it's that. Paul uses the word but five times in these three verses because he is trying to convey something to the audience, but also to himself in the midst of everything that happened that we didn't expect to happen, that didn't go the way that we anticipated. In spite of all that, we have this treasure. We have this power that is resident on the inside of us that is not predicated on your physicality. That's not predicated on your circumstance. We have a treasure on the inside. That but is God's intervention and presence in our lives. Afflicted, but not crushed. Yes, you are suffering and you feel compressed, but you could have been pulverized. But God, perplexed but not in despair. Yes, you are confused, unsure of which way to turn, but you are not driven to the complete absence of hope. But God, persecuted but not forsaken. Yes, folks are coming for your head and treating you bad, but you are not alone, abandoned or deserted, but God, Struck down, but not destroyed. Yes, folks have set you aside, canceled you, and tried to make you feel like you were less than who God called you to, but they couldn't end you. They didn't abolish you, and they didn't ruin you, but God, yes, you are bruised, but you are not broken. Yes, you have stumbled, but you didn't fall. And yes, maybe you did fall, but it says that the righteous man falls seven times, but gets back up eight times. What is Paul trying to remind us? We are going to face stuff. Period. Some of our angst is because we stop and we're like, why us? Why us? And it's our, in our, our inability to accept the simple truth that sucky stuff is going to happen. It just is. And like I said, it ain't always God. It ain't always the devil. It ain't even sometimes us. It is what it means to walk around in your clay jar. It is what it means 
to be a human. It is what it means to have lungs in your body. That life is going to happen. But guess what? There's a treasure inside. Even if your body is failing you, there is a treasure inside. There is something extraordinary in the inside of you, and sometimes you don't even see it until it's breaking. Right? Because there's a treasure in the jar, but you can't see inside the jar. And often it is not until it breaks that you even see or notice the treasure. Kintsugi is the Japanese art, if you've heard of it, of repairing broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage with a lacquer that is dusted with gold or silver or platinum. And as a, a philosophy, it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object rather than something to disguise it. So instead of trying to hide the breakage and the flaws, it beautifies it. We know a little bit something about that because our mama would just say, baby, you don't look like what you've been through. We know a little bit about bedazzling and sparkling and glittering up the circumstances that the things that have gone into our life, we know how to mold it and craft it so that we look like masterpieces and pieces of art, that we take those broken pieces and we say that they are not going to define us, but for, oh, we're going to let those things forge us ahead. We know a little bit about taking the broken parts and the hurtful parts, and the painful parts, and those situations, and glittering them, and dazzling them, and lacquering them up, and saying, baby, here I am, and all of my authenticity, and all of my mess, and all of my imperfections, and all of my flaws, I am me, the good and the bad. And as Pastor Mike sometimes says, strong in the broken places. There's a treasure in the, in the breaking. You know, we, 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 we've been singing this song more than able that is whole, had, whole, had me in a chokehold for, I don't know, a couple of months. Every time the song comes on, I, I, I am in a Jesus snot cry real bad. And I don't know if you heard me screaming when Dante was singing. I was like, oh, here, here come my part. Because one of my favorite parts is, he's not through with me yet. You remember, our, you remember our grammar lesson from earlier, right? Yet is also a conjunction. And but and yet are cousins. Because what they both mean is that whatever is said before the thing contrasts whatever is after the word. That's why I said, but yet yeah, that's that intervention. Crushed, but not destroyed. He's not through with me yet because there's so much more to the story. But, and yet, small words that show the impact of God's presence in our lives. Yes. You got the di diagnosis, but God's not done with you yet. Yes, you lost your hair, but you're going to put a crown on it, baby, and look good because God is not done with you yet. Yeah, you might be in a smaller pair of jeans now because you can't eat food the same, but God's not done with you. You can't always be in the building every Sunday because maybe you don't feel so well, but God's not done with you. There's so much more to the story. Because no matter what your body is telling you, no matter what your circumstance is telling you, no matter what your situation is telling you, Paul reminds us, but there is a treasure. And the treasure is not predicated on the outside. It is something that is on the inside. Shirley Caesar used to sing a song. She says, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. In the world, some, in the world can't 
take it away. I think one of the keys, because the, the theme for today is unstoppable joy. You're like, when is she going to get to that? One of the keys to unstoppable joy, I think, is the ability to acknowledge the buts and the yets in our life. I preached on joy a couple of months ago back in April for Hope Center Sunday, and that notion of joy has just kind of sat with me. And I said in that sermon that joy is a prescription to our pain. It helps you manage what happens before that but and that yet. Because the reality is we may not always get to choose our circumstances. There's many things that are happening in our lives that we would not choose for ourselves. We don't want no parts of it. Yet and still it is here. And we may not get to choose our circumstances, but we can choose our disposition towards them. And joy becomes that bomb in the cracks of our pain. It becomes that gold dusted lather. It is lacquer. It is that response to inhumane circumstances in our life and in this world. Joy is a choice to live in the counter narrative. Because sometimes the only narrative we like to live in is the negative one. But our joy gives us a counter negative. It doesn't deny what we are experiencing or going through, but it just reminds us that there is something else because God is not done with us yet. I get to choose how I show up to this party. Even if I didn't want to be invited, even if I didn't want to be here, I get to choose. And I think what Paul was saying was, I choose joy. But not just any type of joy, an unstoppable joy. Because an unstoppable joy is one that is impossible to prevent. It's not predicated on what you're experiencing or going through. It is your choice to show up and find that little bit of gold lacquer in the midst of a lot of stuff. It is the choice when you are broken and dropped and in pieces to decide that you're going to get back up again. It is a choice to smile in the midst of your tears. It is the choice to say hallelujah even when you're angry at God and you don't understand. Joy is a choice. It is the choice to live fully in your unique clay jar because that's the other thing about jar. they're not all made the same each and every one is hand crafted by the potter it is a one of one limited edition there is none like it before and there will not be another like it you have this unique clay jar and whereas some people try to discount you because of the dings in your in your jar because of what you might look like on the outside. God says, but there's this treasure. The world looks at the this. God looks at this. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves, because in a world that fights daily to take away our beauty and our individuality, that tells us to adjust to whatever the culture is saying or doing. We have to find ways to show up and show out who, as who we are. We saw Sunita in that video talking about her cancer journey and we were talking about how she, it, may I share the story? Um, when she realized that she was gonna lose her hair. So, she decided that she was going to buy a crown so that when she lost her hair, she wore that crown. She reminded herself of who she was. Her hair did not define her. And if you look at her today, she got these pink braids. If you follow her on Instagram, she'd be like, let me show. Look, she'd be like, y'all, my hair is growing. These edges are back. And she just, but whether she had the hair or not, 
She chose joy. You saw her in the video, she was like, I'ma put this makeup on. Y'all gonna see me out here cute. She didn't let it define her, though it will always be with her in a way. There are some things that we experience and go through that are always with us. That doesn't mean that they have to define us. That is a choice. And at the moment, you look in the mirror at your clay jar and have the nerve to say that it's not enough. It's not pretty enough. It's not shaping the right way. Why is my handle look this way? You remember that the potter crafted you. But not only that, there is a treasure on the inside of you that nobody gets to take away. You can only give it away. If you give it away, that's your choice, but can't nobody come and take that thing. Who are we to deny what the Lord can do? It's okay to be, have faith and be in expectation of something changing. But whether it does or not, a treasure. You have the choice to choose joy in spite of your circumstances. Amen? Amen. Amen. And right now, I'd like to call up, I know it's Breast Cancer Awareness Sunday, but I want to call up anyone who has had some type of cancer diagnosis. I want the leaders, please come so that we can pray with folk. And we want to pray. And remind you that you are not alone. Again, talking to Sunita, she talked about, we talked about how the fact was that she went through treatment during COVID. So she was by herself. But she said she wasn't by herself. Because in that room with her while she was getting that treatment, God was with her. And she had her straight, and she was reminded, and she had faith. And even though sometimes your family and your loved ones are not journeying in this thing, they don't know what your body feels like, they don't know what your experience is like, you are never alone. You are never forgotten. You get to have joy. You get to have hope. You get to have faith. You get that. God, we are here in these clay jars, broken, tired, weary, angry, confused, hurt. We don't always have the words to articulate what we are feeling on the inside. Some of us have cried more tears than we care to mention. We don't have no more tears to cry. For some of us, we feel like we are at our wit's end. God, for each and every individual under the sound of my voice, remind them of the treasure that is resident on the inside of them. Cancer is a word, but is not the end-all be-all. 
there are still things that you have called them to, still visions that they have and dreams that they want to dream and things that they wish to do. And every day that they wake up, let them be reminded that they are enough at 1%, at 10%, on the days where they can get out of bed and the days when they are resting on their back, that there is still something on the inside, a treasure of extraordinary power. Because we know what happens when our weakness links up with your strength, God. We can do exceedingly and abundantly more than we thought or imagined because you are more than able. Let us not give up on ourselves. Let us keep fighting and pressing because there is going to come a day when we all meet you and when we do we want to hear those words well done my good and faithful servant God's not through with you yet there is so much more to your story you get to rejoice you get to put on the crown you get to dance, you get to eat all the food, you get to do what you want to do, you get to walk in the shoes that you want to walk in, you get to live. So because you are still here, live. Because there's still breath in your lungs, live. Don't just survive, thrive. Whatever that looks like for you, and it may not look the same as it did a year ago, five years ago. So what? We are ever evolving. We change. We adjust. We go in the fire and we come out stronger. But if I remember those three Hebrew boys, they were in the fire, but they certainly were not alone. And there is a God who walks with you and talks with you and knows you by name. Your name is powerful. Your name is unshakable. Your name is adaptable. Your name is child of God. Your name is worthy. Don't let the diagnosis define who you are and the name that God calls you by. Because God doesn't see your outside. God sees that treasure on the inside. And we thank you, God, for these collective moments. But in the moments when they are alone, and it's the dark of night, and that despair that Paul talks about hits, remind them there's a treasure on the inside that the world didn't give, and the world can't take away. Amen. Amen.